The following program is a Town of Colony television production of the William K. Sanford Town Library. Hello, I'm Colony Town Judge Peter Crummy, and welcome to Benchmark. We'll explore a variety of issues involving our justice system, our legal system, and how they relate to the citizens of the town of Colony. Today, we're truly fortunate to have one of Capital Region's premier attorneys, not only in the practice of criminal law, but also in civil law. Please join me in welcoming Michael McDermott. Thank you, Judge. Counselor, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, you have so much to uh, tell us, and uh, of course, we're, we're constrained by uh, just a short amount of time because the involvement uh, that you've had in a variety of cases, both criminal and civil, in and around the Capital Region certainly uh, speaks well of your uh, capacity and um, uh, interest on behalf of your clients. Um, as I understand, a graduate of Albany Law School, Yes, Albany and, Law. And of course, before that was Siena College. Siena College, yes, who did so well recently, right, in the NCAAs. Well, they've certainly made the entire community proud in that way mm -hmm. as well. And then on to um, civil practice and ultimately also uh, spending some significant time in the uh, district attorney's offices of not only Rensselaer County, but also of Albany County as well. That's right, yep. And involved in so many um, celebrated prosecutions uh, during your capacity as Chief Assistant District Attorney in Albany County, including the prosecution of the people of the state of New York versus Christopher Porco. And in that regard, Counselor, what's the status of that case right now? Well, the, uh, the status is that the, the uh, uh, defense has filed uh, their appeal. Um, the DA's office is working on their response. Uh, Chris Horn is in charge of the appellate office at the DA's office. Uh, he was kind enough to provide me a copy of the, uh, of the brief, which I read with great interest. Uh, long brief, like 120, 140 pages. Um, so hopefully that, uh, you know, by sometime this fall, the case will be fully briefed and argued um, down in Brooklyn because it's down in front of the second department. And, uh, you know, late fall, we'll probably have a decision and see what happens. Michael, some of that case during the prosecution and some of the cases that uh, we see uh, so often reported upon now um, involve uh, evidence collection, evidence gathering, and most importantly, of course, is the technological advances of society, which have had an impact on criminal prosecutions and even civil cases as well. And routinely, when I'm in high school speaking with students about the, the state of the uh, court system, uh, and I do ask students what they would like to do and how they'd like to further their studies, routinely they tell me they're interested in forensic science. And of course, some of our popular television shows today on the networks also highlight forensic science. Has that had a major impact on your conduct and practice of law? Oh, absolutely. I mean, not, not just in the, the criminal realm, but also in the civil realm. Um, with the advances of technology, I mean, so much is uh, possible today that even 10 years ago we couldn't dream of uh, the type of evidence, uh, the type of documentation that you can have available, whether you're involved in a criminal case or a civil case. And uh, just from very routine things that people, you know, don't even uh, uh, give much uh, thought to, uh, things like their cell phone, you know, recording everything, uh, all their contacts, all their communications, the text messages that are saved, instant messages, email. Um, most people don't carry very much cash even anymore. Everything is a debit card. Um, so just very routine things leave tracks, leave traces. You know, And if you're trying to figure out you know, who somebody's associated with, where they've been, what they've been doing, there's a lot of very routine stuff that's available for an investigator now. And that's not even going the next level to you know, DNA type of uh, proof or, uh, you know, more sophisticated evidence uh, techniques. Well, it's interesting that you brought up DNA, and I want to go back on mm -hmm. some of these other advances as well and how they've impacted both positively and negatively uh, in the prosecution of uh, matters. But in DNA, I know that the our, our own court system is required to um, uh, impose a, a DNA test on 
in regard to certain convictions mm -hmm. and even in, and collect the $50 New York State fee for the administration of the tests. Common example, if you're convicted of petty larceny, you must submit to a DNA sample as well. Have you had any cases in your experience where DNA collection actually helped bring about justice? Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, as you well know, that the list of crimes for which you have to collect DNA now ha is constantly expanding, constantly expanding. Um, and we had a case when I was in the DA's office in Albany <clears throat> where there was an, an unsolved homicide on Madison Avenue. It was a, it was a brutal uh, knife attack. A woman was killed in her home. And uh, there really was very little in the way of uh, forensic evidence, but there was one, uh, one spot of blood where the suspect had, uh, we believe, cut himself and left some blood. And that was submitted for DNA analysis. Um, and they developed a DNA profile, but it didn't match it to anybody. And then a little while later, there was a, a rape in the same neighborhood of an elderly woman, and they recovered DNA at that crime scene. They had it analyzed, and it turned out that they matched. The homicide and the rape matched. But again, there was no name to, uh, to associate with the profile. And uh, the police investigated the case for a couple years, and there, was, there were no leads, so it was a seeming dead end. And then there was another homicide in the city of Albany. Um, an elderly man was killed in his home, and yet again there was DNA found, and that DNA was analyzed, and it went back to the earlier crimes. The same person had left DNA at all three crime scenes, two murders and one rape. Um, once again, that investigation seemed to be at a dead end when out of the blue we got notice that um, uh, pursuant to the DNA collection that's done by the courts uh, at the time of a conviction, somebody who was convicted, I believe it was in Schenectady County, of a burglary and who had to give that mandatory DNA sample, that sample was analyzed and they put all of the samples in a computer that try and randomly you know, match things. And it came back that it was his DNA. The two murders and the rape belonged to the person who was convicted of the burglary. So the Albany police went out to the state prison spoke to the uh, individual and he confessed. So three crimes, you know, two, two murders and a rape were solved simply because he, this person had to give a DNA sample and he was convicted of, you know, an unrelated offense. And I think you're going to see that more and more and more and more and more because the database is just growing and growing and growing. Um, and it's a huge tool, for, especially for cold type cases. Do you think the state legislature is overreaching in the number of types of convictions that it requires DNA, or do you think it hasn't gone far enough? Well, you know, I mean, I think there's always concerns about, you know, privacy and, and uh, um, having that kind of information in a computer database. But really, we've been fingerprinting people for, like, everything forever. And that's the same kind of thing. It's a unique identifier. It's not a lot different than the DNA, although obviously you can use the DNA um, profile to discover other things, maybe some medical things and like inherited traits and things like that. So it has the potential for uh, abuse. But I, you know, I think if you if you are convicted of a crime, it's not such a high price for society to pay to ask that you give this DNA sample, especially because, as you well know, a lot of times uh, you know people kind of graduate in the seriousness of uh, their offenses, and they may start off with a small property crime but they can graduate into crimes of violence. And if you've got the DNA sample on the little, because they you know, were convicted of a petty larceny, you know, maybe that's going to help you solve you know, a rape or a burglary or a murder 10 years down the line. Well, it continues to be expanded in that way. And we spoke about something else earlier, too, which may be an issue currently in front of our Court of Appeals here in the state of New York. And that's the use of GPS tracking uh, systems uh, as, a, um, as a tool or mechanism in order to support an arrest in a particular case. What's that case about now, and uh, what, what are your feelings on the use by law enforcement of GPS tracking systems? Yeah, I think, I think the, the name of that case is uh, People of the State of New York against Weaver. And uh, it was a case where uh, the police were investigating burglaries and they had a suspect, um, but I don't think they had anything beyond you know, a gut feeling or a hunch that, that this, you know, Weaver fellow was the person responsible for the burglaries. So what they did was they attached one of these very small portable GPS devices to his car. And um, it used to be that the, the GPS that you'd have to attach to a car 
required almost breaking into the car and hooking it up to the car battery because they were big and they were clunky and they needed a lot of energy. But as technology is developed, they've gotten smaller, the amount of energy you need to power them is less. So they, you know, the size of a hockey puck and you just stick it on the back of the car and you're, you know, you can do it as you're walking past a car. You don't have to, you know, monkey around with any tools or anything. So they put the GPS on based on the hunch and then they tracked his whereabouts for a good period of time. Uh, ultimately, he was arrested for a burglary, and at his trial, they used some of this proof of where he had been that they had gotten from the GPS. And uh, he was convicted, and then on appeal, his attorney argued that the police basically shouldn't have done that without some prior court approval, that there should have been a warrant, or at the very least, there should have been maybe some standard applied rather than just the police doing it on a hunch. You know, oftentimes, as you know, um, you know, police have to make decisions and they have to base it on some objective standard. And we usually say, you know, reasonable cause or probable cause. Um, and right now, the law doesn't require reasonable cause or probable cause to attach a GPS device. So I could, you know, somebody could be attaching one to my car right now in well, the parking right. lot. So uh, the appellate division, the first layer of appeals, uh, found that the police were justified. Uh, because the cops didn't do anything that they couldn't have done with their naked eyes if they had devoted the resources to it. Right. It had people tailing this guy and just watching where he went. But uh, there was one dissent in the appellate division that thought maybe this was a little too much. Maybe this is a little bit different than just tailing somebody. Um, so we're going to see what the Court of Appeals has to say. It's, an, it's a fascinating case from a you know right to privacy uh, perspective. Um, I personally think that the court's going to require that there be something more than a hunch before you can do that. You know, it's almost like, you know, in uh, in like Africa, uh, and you're on a safari and you shoot an animal with a tracking device so you can figure out where they're going. You know, I don't think you can do the same kind of thing to human beings without some kind of right. um, some kind of objective criteria. Well, we'll, we'll all look forward to the uh, court's decision in that matter. Tell me about other technology, video surveillance. I, whenever I'm uh, making presentations uh, routinely uh, to our schools, I will tell them that you should presume you're on video. Oh. And uh, I think that uh, as we enter outside of our home into the uh, public arena, whether you're in a grocery store or whether you're at the mall or whether you're in a parking lot, presume you're on video. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that uh, video surveillance has actually assisted or actually um, been a negative in connection with some type of um, uh, case that you've been involved with? Well, it can be both, you know, and there, there was a case in Albany, um, actually it was in the town of Gilderland. There was a murder in the town of Gilderland. Uh, a young man was killed in his apartment and uh, there was video surveillance in the lobby of the apartment, okay? and the video camera caught uh, somebody leaving the, the apartment, but it was, it was a poor quality video, and um, you know, the, the sun uh, was shining through the door, so there was a lot of glare. So all you really saw was a shadow. You couldn't, couldn't make out a face, and even the clothing of the person who was leaving, you couldn't make it out with you know, real fine definition. You know, it was a black and white video, okay? But the police had an idea who the perpetrator was. And uh, one of the things they wanted to do was to find out what was this particular suspect wearing that day. And did it look anything like the person that was seen on the video coming out of the victim's apartment? So again, using just, uh, you know, like uh, bank account records, um, we found out that he had gone uh, into a bank, I believe in Colony, earlier that day to make a transaction. And uh, we have video of him in the bank waiting online to cash his check. And when you analyze the clothing that he was wearing at the bank to the clothing that was seen on the video at the time of the crime, you could tell that it matched. And, and interesting, interestingly, even though the, the um, video that was taken at the crime scene was of a poor quality, he was wearing those type of sneakers that are Velcro and that have a flap on them. You could see at the bank that the flaps were all, they weren't attached. They were all hanging back as if that's the way he habitually wore them. And you could see in the video at the crime scene, somebody was wearing sneakers that had a flap, but they were going the opposite direction. Right. Um, so that was very helpful. But in the same case, 
you can see you could see on another surveillance camera from the parking lot you saw right about the time that this person exited the uh, apartment you saw a car go by that was kind of suspicious so it kind of throws in a red herring you know and the defense can say well who was in that car right. you know was that so right it's a mixed bag defense can use it to try and muddy up the waters and introduce speculation that you know maybe there was other people involved but it certainly helps uh, to build a case now technology of course has uh, followed uh, people right into the courthouse and of course there was a uh, cell phones or seem to be a pretty much a mainstay in our society now and oftentimes people will uh, bring them into uh, the courthouse and um, and certainly uh, they're not allowed to use them uh, in that way I know there was a, a celebrated case out in uh, in Buffalo where a city court judge I think uh, became exasperated about the uh, the cell phone that went off and no one would stand up and admit it was theirs and I think he set bail on all 45 uh, people in the courthouse and they were all taken off uh, to the uh, Niagara County um, I think or Erie County uh, correctional facility until they posted bail uh, subsequently of course I think the uh, uh, the judge found uh, that he may have been overreaching <laughs> in that way and uh, I believe he was certainly admonished uh, for that kind of reaction however it's clear that there should be no moment for cell phones and PDAs in the courthouse can you think of a time when actually it was it became a detriment uh, in a particular case an ongoing case that uh, technology was in the courthouse whether it was supposed to be there or not yeah, I mean, I I have not had any personal experiences along those lines, but I, I have read of, I mean, recently read of cases in, in other parts of the country where jurors were, you know, texting during deliberations, communicating with people outside the jury room where uh, jurors had, um, you know, PDAs or cell phones that were equipped with, you know, Internet access, mm -hmm. and they were doing Google searches, trying to do some research on a topic that was subject of the trial. Um, Twitter, I don't know if you've heard of the Twitter, you know, people have that instant uh, communication and update thing. Somebody was using the Twitter during the course of a trial. So, I mean, I think you and I and everybody uh, are so used to the instant contact that we can have now with people, uh, with family, and get on the internet and, you know, do some quick research about something. We've got to take that into account in our criminal and civil trials because jurors don't expect to be cut off from that communication for any period of time. You know, if they don't have their cell phones, uh, if they can't, uh, you know, send their emails or text messages, you know, I think they feel they ha they're entitled to, but we got to make sure that they're not using it in such a way that, you know, it's going to violate some of the rules and make, you know, a trial that lasted three weeks get reversed because they had to get on the Internet during jury deliberations. Correct. That's uh, absolutely right. We're looking for uh, reversible error and uh, certainly uh, with the time it takes to preside over a jury trial and the citizens that are required to make that work and the commitment they have to make as well, uh, certainly um, uh, they're going to have to uh, address that issue head on. Tell me about, you mentioned debit card transactions. Mm -hmm. How have those electronic transactions played into any type of criminal case that you've seen? Well, a couple, a couple ways. I mean, number one, it's a good way to try and establish, uh, you know, where somebody's been. Um, you know, if you're trying to figure out where somebody was on a particular day or during a particular time period, it kind of almost gives you a map. You know, they went to Stewart's at, you know, 2 o'clock, then they went to the drive through at McDonald's at 3 o'clock, you know, and then they were home using their debit card on the Internet to buy something off of eBay. I mean, so it gives you a lot of information about what somebody's up to. And then also, um, every ATM's got a video, you know, and right. you get video so you can see, like, what were they wearing at that particular time. So if you have a witness who says, oh, you know, a guy wearing a red shirt is the guy who, you know, stole my purse, and you see somebody, at the, you know, that person that you've has already been identified as a suspect wearing similar clothes on the video, it just helps to build, build the case. Um, it's also interesting because sometimes you find out uh, information about people who may have been involved that you wouldn't have otherwise found out about because you get that video and standing next to them, behind them, waiting is a picture of, you know, some guy who was also involved in the, in the case. We've had that happen a number of times. Well, and it's important uh, to lay out, too, for our viewers that 
this information isn't automatically available to prosecutors. It's typically subject uh, to uh, applications to a judge for a warrant. Isn't that correct? Well, or either sometimes a warrant, uh, oftentimes uh, via a grand jury subpoena. Okay. You know, um, a lot of times, um, you know, uh, grand jury issues subpoenas for phone records, for, um, you know, uh, ATM cards, uh, debit cards, credit cards. So it has the them. same uh, level of uh, power as a, a judicial warrant then in that way. Right. It's, still, it's process of a court. Yep, that you're I'm routinely asked to review applications uh, for search warrants. And, um, and, and basically what you're letting us know is grand juries can issue requests and get them honored as well absolutely. for the same information. Absolutely, absolutely. And, um, you know, a lot of the information, like if you want, if I wanted to find out your cell phone information, exactly. they'll send it, the, the, the uh, service provider will send it in electronic searchable form, you know, so that if I'm, you know, if I've got six months of your phone records, you know, I can punch in a, a phone number and then it'll sort through and let me know exactly how many times you called that person and when. I mean, it's very user friendly. Um, and I know law enforcement uses it a lot, especially in drug investigations, because, you know, very few people are using home phones anymore, you know, especially, you know, in the drug trade. You, you know, it's not like you can necessarily get a tap on a landline anymore. Everything's cell phone. They change cell phones frequently just so you know, that uh, they kind of keep the police one step uh, behind them. How do they manage the track phones, those phones you can... Yeah, they're tough. The track phones are tough. When you're dealing with trying to get records on a track phone, it's, it's, it's difficult. It really is. But you know, another thing that um, cell phones are good for is we had a, uh, another murder case in Albany, um, and we knew the defendant was at large, and we knew his cell phone uh, number, and we were trying to find him. And uh, every time you use the cell phone, it's got to bounce off of a cell phone tower. And uh, the cell phone company can triangulate and let you know, you know what area that, that cell phone is moving. So if you're driving your car on your, in your car and you're talking on the cell phone, we can pretty much figure out that, oh, Judge Crummy's on the north way. He's pretty close to you know, exit five or whatever. And in that particular case, that's exactly what we did. And the colony police stopped the suspects uh, on Route 7 just based on tracking him with uh, his cell phone. There was no GPS or anything. We just knew contemporaneously what cell phones, uh, towers he was hitting off of. So, you know, there's a lot of information out there. Yes, there is. You know, and you've certainly um, spent a tremendous amount of time in the criminal law and uh, have um, accomplished so very much in that field. But I know you practice in the civil law as well. And why don't you tell us what types of cases you're involved in on that end? Sure. Um, for the last two years, I've been working at uh, O'Connell and Aronowitz. And um, specifically, I've been doing a lot of uh, lead paint cases, representing uh, young children who have been poisoned by lead. Um, typically, those cases involve... Uh, you know, um, uh, children are living in a rental property, usually. Um, it's usually, you know, inner city, um, old homes that uh, were built before, you know, lead paint was banned. And uh, unfortunately, oftentimes, landlords don't take care of the property very well. Um, you know, some, some of the uh, families may be receiving, you know, public assistance or Section 8 type benefits. And um, because the landlords haven't kept the properties up, the paint starts to chip and deteriorate. And uh, that's when the lead can be exposed in the environment. And a child can either, you know, pick at the chipping paint as toddlers are, you know, uh, get into everything. Or just by uh, opening and closing the windows, you've got the, the friction surfaces and the paint uh, deteriorates and turns into a powder. The child can either breathe that in or get it on their fingers or on their toys and put it in their mouth and then they get exposed to lead. And lead is a neurotoxin that's especially dangerous for children because it goes directly to the brain because the uh, human metabolism uh, will mistake the lead for something like calcium that's necessary for brain development. Uh, because lead in, it, in and of itself has no, no legitimate purpose in the human body. I mean, it's not like iron or zinc or calcium that, that the body needs to grow. Lead, there's no good effect from lead. But the body recognizes lead, uh, thinks it's either calcium or iron, and goes to the developing brain, 
and it kills brain cells. And uh, you know, because the human brain develops on a certain pattern, if that development is interrupted during childhood, it's not like um, it can pick up later on in life. I mean, once those areas are damaged, they're damaged forever and there's no medication or surgery or anything that can um, put the brain back to where it should have been. So we find these children experience uh, learning disabilities. Uh, most often they end up in special education. They have uh, you know, attention deficit, hyperactivity uh, problems. So those are the children that I've been representing for the last two years. So it's a, it's a very satisfying practice because you're, you know, you're helping kids you know, hopefully you know, recover enough so that they can, you know, adequately take care of themselves in the future. What are some things families can look for when they're considering a premises to reside in to uh, uh, protect themselves from maybe uh, confronting this problem? Yeah, you know, even if you, you know, if you want to, if you're going to buy an older home, you should have it tested for the presence of lead. I mean, every contract, in the, every real estate contract in the state of New York allows the purchaser to test the premises before they before they close on the property. And you should really do that because if you have young children, you need to know if there's lead in the house because it's, it's very preventable. With good maintenance, um, you can really keep your kids away from that danger. Um, and that's really all it, all it entails is good maintenance. I mean, you need to make sure that any acts, any areas that are accessible to a child, uh, the paint is intact and it's not p chipping, it's not peeling, it's not painting. Uh, you need to also probably a good thing to do is to replace the windows. You know the old double hung windows that have the the pulleys and the ropes. Right. Those are real big culprits for lead exposure. So have the windows replaced. Um, but but you you need to check because unfortunately in New York, the only time um, the government uh, will inspect the house for presence of lead is after a child who lives there has been poisoned. You know, and there's been a lot of lobbying efforts that. O'Connell and Aronowitz has been involved in to try and make the health departments more proactive to test a place, especially rental places, before a family moves in to make sure it's safe instead of waiting until somebody's poisoned and then having it tested. Michael, this practice uh, brings you across the state of New York, is that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you find that there are certain areas uh, or uh, urban centers that uh, have more incidents of these issues or not necessarily it's across the board? Well, it's, it's absolutely more in the urban areas. Right. Um, I mean, we practice in you know, Buffalo and Rochester and Syracuse uh, Capital District, and it's, it's the older homes that are mostly rental properties that are owned by you know landlords who have you know a hundred units and they barely take care of any of them and you see a lot of, I mean their usual tenancy is you know a year you know people move in people move out landlords do you know the minimal amount required uh, and that's where we see the kids that have been poisoned most often sometimes not but most often is protection afforded by encapsulating the lead or having to actually remove it from the structure? Well, removing it from the structure is usually so cost prohibitive, right. you know. Uh, encapsulating it, you know, if you've got an area that, um, if it's especially like it's a plaster wall that's prone to, you know, chipping, uh, you can, you know, cover it with sheetrock and uh, encapsulate it that way. Uh, there are certain paints that are designed to encapsulate uh, areas that you can use. Um, so there are various ways, and it's easy to find out, too. If anybody just calls the Albany County Health Department, they'll send you a ton of information about how to make your home safe. But uh, it's, it's one of these preventable public health issues. I mean, no child needs to be uh, lead poisoned, and it only takes you know, uh, a, minimal a minimal amount of maintenance and vigilance on the part of uh, the property owner to make sure that the, the homes are safe. Well, we've been very lucky to have Michael McDermott of O'Connell and Aronowitz uh, join us today to uh, speak um, ever so briefly on uh, criminal and civil law. Uh, Michael, you're also involved in a variety of uh, community activities as well. You're a member of the Albany County Bar Association and, um, and also uh, serve in a variety of capacities in the community as well. Is there any one that you'd like other to mention to us uh, in connection uh, with your outside activities? Um, well, you know, I was, I was involved with the um, uh, Sentencing Reform Commission that just um, issued its report a few months ago to the governor and to the legislature. Um, I'm heartened to hear, like on today's news, talking about um, 
Uh, there's a real serious push between uh, the governor and the legislature to reform the Rockefeller drug laws this year. I think that's something that's overdue. Um, I think that, uh, you know, a lot of our crime is committed by people who are, you know, trapped in this cycle of addiction. And um, rather than warehousing them in correctional facilities, that it's, uh, it's more humane and it's a better allocation of resources to put the money into treatment programs um, and to, uh, to really try and return them to being productive members of society. I mean, some people, you know, some people obviously belong in state prison, but I think there's a, there is a sizable portion of the population of the correctional facilities that could be returned to the community that could benefit from uh, rehabilitation. Um, you know, there are drug courts that, you know, Judge, Judge Herrick runs a, a drug court in Albany that's been very successful uh, where you hang uh, the threat of imprisonment over somebody's head to coerce them into getting the treatment that they probably needed for 10 years but are only getting now because they realize it's, it's now or never. They're going to spend, you know, 10, 20 years in state prison unless they address the issue now. So, you know, I'm heartened to see that, that that's moving forward. Well, I certainly don't disagree with you uh, based on my vantage point um, handling the uh, 28th busiest criminal docket in the state of New York. That addiction is very much underneath so much of the um, uh, alleged criminal activity that takes place mm. in and around uh, that ends up in our court system. And thank you for your comments today. Michael, thank you very much for joining us. We're so lucky to have you here today. Thank you, Judge. It's been a pleasure. I'm Judge Peter Crummy. And thank you for joining me on Benchmark. <laughs>